It's frightening to think about how many people go missing each year. Approximately 1,600 individuals mysteriously vanish each year in national parks alone. One moment they're there, making their way down a hiking trail or stopping for a granola bar by a lake, and the next, they're gone. Missing people are an unfortunate fact of life, one we all just try to put out of our minds as we silently hope we, and those we know and love, will be fortunate enough to avoid joining the ranks of the lost. But some places, some very strange, obscure places, nestled in the quiet countryside and tucked away under blankets of fog, lose so many people that it becomes, well, anomalous. One particular town, a seemingly innocuous place with a thriving tourism industry, was the site of so many unexplained disappearances that it drew the attention of the SCP Foundation. They dispatched a team to enter the town, to gather as many facts and figures as they could, and to see what exactly had become of these missing people. Leading the team was none other than the sometimes fearless, often shameless, Dr. Jack Bright. How did the infamous Dr. Bright get here? Well, for many employees of the SCP Foundation, leading a task force to investigate a new, potentially anomalous location would be a promotion or a welcome diversion from yet another round of testing to see if maybe something will finally destroy SCP-682. But in this particular case, it was a matter of discipline. After Dr. Bright was caught giving SCP-999 a triple shot of espresso to, quote, just see what would happen, he was assigned to field work as part of his punishment. For the record, what happened was SCP-999 ricocheting off the walls at such a high speed and intensity that it broke several windows, damaged the ceiling, and knocked out the power for half of the site. And so, Dr. Bright found himself with a task force of Foundation operatives trudging reluctantly through beautiful but boring rural New England toward the town of interest. As he drove down the winding road, grumbling to himself and wishing he could be anywhere else, he spotted the sign marking their intended destination, Welcome to Silent Hill. Up ahead, a thick fog rolling off the lake covered the town in a dim gray blur. He couldn't make out anything through the unnaturally dense haze. He squinted and turned on the high beams, but the light did nothing to cut through the fog, bouncing off of it like a billowing curtain of white. Just as they passed the sign, the van began to slow rapidly, its engine sputtering and grinding as the vehicle skidded to a sudden stop. Damn it! Dr. Bright thumped the steering wheel in frustration. Any of you know how to fix a car? He looked at the team of operatives in the back seat. They all shrugged non-committally. The only thing worse than wandering into that fog would be sitting in the broken down van watching Tweedledum and Tweedledumber try to attend to the failing engine. His private joke almost lifted his mood, but not quite. He popped open the door and stepped out into the cold, damp air. Well, figure it out. I'm gonna go look around. Dr. Bright shoved his hands into his pockets and, not knowing what might wait on the other side, began his walk into Silent Hill. With each step, he ruminated on the events that had gotten him here. Where did those guys at the Foundation get off disciplining him like an unruly child? Sure, he liked his pranks. He enjoyed a good joke, and maybe sometimes he took it just a little bit too far but he'd like to see them confront the existential dread of immortality without needing a humorous outlet every now and then. They'd crack under the pressure without a release of some kind, so what gave them the right to put him, a brilliant, if unconventional mind, in some kind of glorified time out? He scoffed out loud to himself, and the sound echoed in the vacant streets. The sheer emptiness of it all snapped him out of his self-pity, and for the first time, he looked up to take in his surroundings. The stubborn fog refused to dissipate, no matter how far he walked, but at least he could make out the shape of the buildings now, of parked cars on the side of the road. No, not parked, wrecked, abandoned, left to rust. He scanned the fog for human silhouettes, listened for voices, for any signs of life, but there was no one. He approached a building and found it dilapidated, rotted wood collapsing in on itself, windows cracked, door boarded up tight. The buildings next to it looked very much the same. What the hell? He was sent to investigate recent disappearances, but this town looked as if its entire population had vanished decades ago. Or, he thought with a small shudder, all decided to leave in a hurry. What could have driven them out? Okay, that's it, I'm done, Dr. Bright remarked, turning a swift 180 degrees and preparing to go back the way he came. 
As he did, he froze. Where there had once been continuous unbroken road, the street now ended in a jagged edge, a deep, dark chasm, the only thing that waited beyond. It was too broad to jump across, and he couldn't see another road out of town. Hey, guys? He called out, hoping to draw the attention of one of the men he had left with the van. A little help over here? But there was no response. Hello? He shouted again, louder this time. When no one answered, he repeated to himself again and again with increasing desperation, his voice growing hoarse from the effort. Had they somehow fixed the van and left him there? Had they fallen into the chasm where the road once was and been killed on impact? There was no rational explanation for what was at play here, but as the consciousness of a man living inside of an ancient amulet reminded himself, he very rarely encountered rational things in his life. There had to be a way out. He just had to find it. If he can go back, well, he would just have to keep moving forward. On through the winding labyrinth of the street, through the maze of crumbling buildings looking for any signs of life, he followed a natural bend in the road and suddenly found himself wedged between two buildings down a narrow, claustrophobic alley. It seemed that this place didn't feel much like playing by the ordinary rules of time and space, and while Dr. Bright could usually appreciate a rule breaker, being a little rebellious himself, that uncertainty was putting him on edge. His breaths came in shallow gasps, his chest tight with apprehension. As he turned in a circle, looking for the best way out, he heard a sound behind him, the first noise he had heard other than his own breathing in quite some time. It was the soft, plodding sound of uneven footsteps, like someone small, walking with a limp. He whirled around to face the noise and saw what he might have mistaken for a child until he got a proper look at it. The thing that was steadily approaching him was small and humanoid in shape, but that was where the similarities to a human being ended. Its skin was a pale, mottled gray, the shade of a body fished out of a river after weeks of bloating and decay. Its mouth was a twisted, gaping hole, more like a wound than a mouth, and in place of its eyes were a pair of slits in the pale flesh. It stumbled as it walked, like it was still learning how, but the childish ineptitude did nothing to distract from the creature's menace. As it advanced towards Dr. Bright, he saw the glint of something metal. In the creature's gnarled fist, it held a rusty knife. As it got closer, it slashed haphazardly in his direction, and its mouth opened wider to let out a chilling, high-pitched giggle. This thing was preparing to carve him up and enjoy every second of the job. As he took in the sight of the horrible gray child in front of him, Dr. Bright had been frozen to the spot unable to force his legs to carry him away. But the sight of the knife, the grim realization of just exactly what this thing had in store for him, shocked him back to life. He grabbed a wooden beam leading up against the nearest wall and threw it at the little monster, knocking it onto its back. It was immobilized just long enough for Dr. Bright to get his bearings, turn, and run toward the wider street. As he did, he could hear the gleeful laughter as the creature climbed back to its feet, and it only pushed him to run faster. When he could no longer hear the little footsteps or the warped giggles of the great child, Dr. Bright stopped to catch his breath. So it seemed like there was still life in Silent Hill after all. There just wasn't human life. There was silence for a moment. Nothing but Dr. Bright's heart pounding in his head as he bent over his knees and silently cursed himself for not exercising this body more often. Then the shrill cry of an air raid siren ripped through the foggy air. And for a moment, his heart stopped. What the hell did that sound mean? He stood up inspecting his surroundings for signs of danger. For what? A tornado? A bomb? He wasn't sure, but nothing could have prepared him for what he saw next. The entire landscape had shifted around him in an instant. He was unsure of how exactly to describe it, except to say that this world had gotten darker, more dangerous. Where the streets had been lit by dim gray sunlight filtered through the haze, there was now darkness save for an occasional street lamp with a flickering red bulb. He couldn't be sure if it was a trick of the light, but he could swear there was blood staining the street, smeared across the brick walls of buildings on either side. The town had been ominous before, but now it was like something out of a nightmare. And all the while, the siren continued to blare, warning of a danger he could not see. He needed to find shelter. That was it. From what he didn't know, but whatever was coming could not be good. Dr. Bright ran to the nearest door, twisting the knob, trying to yank it open, but it wouldn't budge. The hinges were rusted shut, 
and there was no time to try and force them open. He tried another door, and another, and another. It was as if the houses knew to try and keep him out, to keep him exposed and vulnerable on the outside. Finally, he reached a two-story house with peeling white paint and a mahogany door, one that looked so familiar, but that he couldn't quite place. When he turned the knob, the door creaked open with ease, and he quickly raced inside, slamming the door shut behind him and locked it. As Dr. Wright slumped against the door, overtaken with exhaustion, an intrusive thought made his stomach drop. Was he alone in this house? Had he really found shelter? Or had he just shut himself inside with something even worse than what waited out there? In the silence, he could swear he heard the quiet thumping of a pulse, but he couldn't tell if it was his own or the house's beating heart. He couldn't just stay here, dreaming up all the horrors that might be waiting. He needed to gather data, investigate his surroundings, and come up with potential solutions. He needed to be a scientist. On unsteady legs, Dr. Bright began to walk the halls of the house, taking in his surroundings properly for the first time. It was dusty and dark, a place left vacant for quite some time, but there were signs of a life once lived within the house's walls. A rocking horse in the corner, a shelf full of well-worn books, the titles scratched an itch in his brain, memories he hadn't touched in decades. Strange that so many of the books in this house would remind him of the pages he once flipped through, staying inside to read while his brother played in the yard outside. His brother. Dr. Bright swallowed the lump in his throat at the thought of TJ. No use going down that path. Not right now. He continued his walk through the house, taking in the cobwebs, the couch covered with plastic, the coffee table, and the TV set. Along the hall leading to the bathroom, there were rows of family pictures hanging in neat little frames. He stopped to take a look, wondering what sort of family had once lived here. As his eyes fell on the first photograph, his blood turned to ice in his veins. A boy looked out from within the frame, a familiar boy with a mop of red hair, a freckled nose, and kind, smiling eyes. No, Dr. Bright whispered to himself, but there was no denying it. It was TJ, his brother, somehow, looking at him from inside a photograph in an abandoned house in Silent Hill. Next, there was a photo of TJ and an older man. Dr. Bright's stomach turned. Their father. Every photograph was of his family, the family he would never know again, not the way they were. And there in one photo in the middle, TJ and his father were joined by another figure, one with the face scratched out of the picture. He knew, though he couldn't see for certain, that it was him removed from the family photo by force, but the bond between them all forever broken. TJ's eyes in the picture seemed to be filled with tears, heartbroken. His father glowered out of the frame at him, pure hatred in his gaze. He couldn't look anymore and turned away. On the opposite wall, another photograph of TJ was waiting. Dr. Bright felt bile rising in his throat. He recognized the photo. He saw it sometimes when he closed his eyes at night was a picture taken with SCP-978, the desire camera, the anomalous camera that reveals its subject's innermost desires. In the photo, TJ's hands were pressed to the lens like an animal clawing at the boundaries of its cage. His eyes were filled with tears spilling over and streaming down his cheeks, and his mouth was wide open in an endless scream of fear and agony. This, Dr. Bright knew, was the wordless scream inside his brother's mind at all times, after so much testing with the Foundation had destroyed him. I tried to help you, he whispered to the picture. I did what I could do. I did what I could to take the pain away. He trailed off, the words dying in his throat, as the sound of a heavy, rattling breath came from the room at the end of the hall. It was a thick, wheezing sound, like a death rattle a dozen times over. He didn't want to see what was making the noise, but as if in a trance, he found his feet carrying him towards it. He crossed the threshold of what should have been in the kitchen, but instead found himself in a dimly lit hospital. The air smelled of formaldehyde and dried vomit, the steady beep of a heart monitor joining the chorus of heavy, agonizing breathing. At the end of the long hall, there was one single room, the door standing slightly ajar. With slow, agonizing steps, Dr. Bright approached the room. The breathing grew louder and louder, the beep of the heart monitor almost deafening in his ears. He could barely separate the strange breathing from his own, finding his breaths coming in time with the painful rattling sound. He pushed the door open, 
and saw a figure lying in a hospital bed. It was once human, but it could only be described now as a conglomerate of disease and pain. On top of the figure's head, thinning in patches but still recognizable, was a lock of red hair. No, TJ, no. Dr. Bright's voice broke off in a sob at the sight. The thing that was once his brother turned, seeking the sound of his voice though he could not see. Isn't this what you wanted? A low voice rumbled behind him. Dr. Bright whirled around to see a dark shadow, red eyes glowing in the low light. It moved like a wisp of black smoke, but he knew that voice well enough to tell him just who it was. His father. You let them do this to him. I... I didn't... I didn't mean for this to happen, Dr. Bright stammered. You didn't care, the demon father roared, and the light bulb above their heads flared and burst, sending shards of glass scattering everywhere. All he ever did was help people to heal pain, and all you ever did was cause it. Dr. Bright found the strength to move, running through the doorway, sending the shape of his father in every direction as the smell of sulfur and blood filled his nose. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He wept as he ran, hearing his father's agonized cries, his brother's labored breathing as he tore back down the hospital hall. As he did, hands began to reach through the walls, the floor, the ceiling. They were rotting, flesh gone green and stiff. Arms followed the hands, then shoulders, then faces. He recognized D-class uniforms, lab coats, face after familiar face. Everyone who had ever worn the amulet, he realized with a sudden wave of nausea. Everyone whose body he had taken, who he had killed, so that he could live. This is what you do. He could hear his father's voice just behind him, the curls of black smoke nipping at his heels. What kind of creature kills to live? Something that deserves to die. But you can't, can you? You're a parasite, sucking all the good and the life from this world until it's an empty husk, just like you. The living graveyard of victims reached for Dr. Bright, tearing at his clothes as he passed them. There were so many, he never realized how many until he saw them all lined up like this. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, he said to every face he passed, but there was no forgiveness in their dead eyes. His father's voice fell silent, but there was no reprieve. Instead, there was the sound of heavy footsteps pursuing him, the grating shriek of a large bladed weapon dragging along the ground. Dr. Bright glanced over his shoulder and saw a massive hulking figure, like a man, but with a jagged metal pyramid covering his head. He was clad in blood-stained clothing and approaching Dr. Bright with the casual menace of something that had killed endless times before and was ready to do it again. It didn't care to chase him. It knew it would eventually catch up. As he looked at the figure, it began to warp, to change. It morphed into something else something he recognized. A man with black hair and gray eyes that revealed nothing but cold malice. A body covered in tattoos of the arcane and the occult, of merciless grinning faces belonging to ancient monsters. And in his hand, a long bladed weapon. A curved sword perfectly engineered for battle. It was impossible he should be contained, but there he was. SCP-076-2 looking at Dr. Bright the same way he had on the day he had first worn the amulet. The day he became an abomination. The sound of his brother's breathing grew louder, his father's voice bellowing in his mind, and he felt the grasp of the fallen Foundation employees at his back. It was all too much, too many reminders of every failure, every hurt. Dr. Bright collapsed to his knees and bared his neck to Abel in submission. You're right, I, I should be punished. I've done nothing but hurt and kill and destroy everything I touch. Just punish me, please. I'm begging you. Then something Dr. Bright never could have expected. The figure that looked like Abel but couldn't be began to laugh. A cruel, hollow sound. <laughs> no. It said in a voice that sounded like a chorus of hundreds. We will release you. Nothing we can do here will ever be worse than the eternity of torment that stretches before you. Good luck to you, Dr. Bright. Jack Bright let out a wail of agony, reaching out to Abel with pleading hands as the entity turned and slowly walked away, leaving him there alone 
with the hell that was his thoughts. Then everything faded to black. Dr. Bright? Dr. Bright! The sound of one of his team members brought Dr. Bright back to consciousness and he opened his eyes. He was lying on the side of the same road he had walked along before, right next to the sign welcoming the group to Silent Hill. You're all still here, he asked weakly. What do you mean? The man looked puzzled. We parked the van, you got out, you fell down, and we've been trying to wake you up. How long was I out? Dr. Bright's vision swam as he tried to wrap his mind around the information. I don't know, about 10 minutes? Now go check out What If You Were Related to Dr. Bright, SCP-590 He Feels Your Pain, and SCP Edition Weirdest Things on Amazon, Dr. Bright's Great Idea, for more funny and tragic tales from the book of Dr. Bright.